How's my sound? It sucks. Is there somebody else that can do it for us? You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and why did I even show up today? Happy Halloween, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Bonus episode here. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. So here we have it, another bonus episode for the folks at home. Yeah, Rish is such a big fan of Halloween that uh, he felt that he needed to give our listeners some sort of present. That's right. So we got together. We opened up a couple of public domain stories. We looked through them. We did a word count. We determined how long it would be to record them, whether Liz would do a female voice. And ultimately, we decided to throw all that out. Yeah. So instead... Here is a recording of me reading W.W. Jacobs' The Monkey's Paw. The Monkey's Paw by W.W. Jacobs One. Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlor of Laburnum Villa the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess, the former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. "'Hark at the wind,' said Mr. White, who— having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. "'I'm listening,' said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. "'Check!' Oh, "'I should hardly think that he'd come to-night,' said the father, with his hand poised over the board. "'Mate,' replied the son. "'That's the worst of living so far out,' bawled Mr. White with sudden and unlooked-for violence. "'Of all the beastly, slushy, out-of-the-way places to live in, this is the worst. "'Pathways a bog and the roads a torrent. "'I don't know what people are thinking about. "'I suppose because only two houses in the road are let, they think it doesn't matter.' "'Never mind, dear,' said his wife, soothingly. "'Perhaps you'll win the next one.' Mr. White looked up sharply just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin gray beard. "'There he is,' said Herbert White, as the gate banged too loudly and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste, and opening the door was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself, so that Mrs. White said, "'Tut, tut!' and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. "'Sergeant Major Morris,' he said, introducing him. The sergeant major shook hands, and taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whiskey and tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire." At the third glass his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk, the little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts, as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of wild scenes and doughty deeds of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it,' said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. "'When he went away he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him!' "'He don't look to have taken much harm,' said Mrs. White politely. "'I'd like to go to India myself,' said the old man, "'just to look round a bit, you know.' "'Better where you are,' said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass, and sighing softly, shook it again. Ah, "'I should like to see those old temples and fakers and jugglers,' said the old man. "'What was that you started telling me the other day about a, a monkey's paw or something, Morris?' "'Nothing,' said the soldier hastily. "'Leastways nothing worth hearing.' 
monkey's paw? said Mrs. White curiously. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him. "'To look at,' said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket. "'It's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy.' He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. "'And what is there special about it?' inquired Mr. White as he took it from his son, and having examined it, placed it upon the table. "'It had a spell put on it by an old faker,' said the sergeant-major. "'A very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it.' His manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter jarred somewhat. "'Well, why don't you have three, sir?' said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him in the way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. "'I have,' he said, quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. "'And did you really have the three wishes granted?' asked Mrs. White. "'I did,' said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. "'As anybody else wished,' persisted the old lady. "'The first man had his three wishes, yes,' was the reply. "'I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. "'That's how I got the paw.' His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. "'If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now, then, Morris,' said the old man at last. "'What do you keep it for?' The soldier shook his head. "'Fancy, I suppose,' he said slowly. "'I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. "'It has caused enough mischief already. "'Besides, people won't buy. "'They think it's a fairy tale, some of them, "'and those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterward.' "'If you could have another three wishes,' said the old man, eyeing him keenly, "'would you have them?' "'I don't know,' said the other. "'I don't know.' He took the paw, and dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. "'Better let it burn,' said the soldier solemnly. "'If you don't want it, Morris,' said the other, "'give it to me.' "'I won't,' said his friend doggedly. "'I threw it on the fire. "'If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. "'But pitch it on the fire again like a sensible man.' "'The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. "'How do you do it?' he inquired. "'Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud,' said the sergeant-major. "'But I warn you of the consequences.' "'Sounds like the Arabian Nights,' said Mrs. White, as she rose and began to set the supper. "'Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me?' Her husband drew the talisman from pocket, and then all three burst into laughter as the sergeant major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. "'If you must wish,' he said gruffly, "'wish for something sensible.' Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket, and, placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldiers' adventures in India. "'If the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he's been telling us,' said Herbert as the door closed behind their guest, just in time for him to catch the last train, "'we shan't make much out of it.' "'Did you give him anything for it, father?' inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. "'A trifle,' said he, colouring slightly. "'He didn't want it, but I made him take it. "'And he pressed me again to throw it away.' "'Likely,' said Herbert, with pretended horror. "'Why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. "'Wish to be an emperor, father, to begin with. "'Then you can't be henpecked.' 
He darted round the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White armed with an anti-macassar. Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. "'I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact,' he said slowly. "'It seems to me I've got all I want.' "'If you only cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you?' said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. "'Well, wish for two hundred pounds, then. That'll just do it.' His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman, as his son, with a solemn face, somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. "'I wish for two hundred pounds,' said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted his words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. "'It moved!' he cried, with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. "'As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake!' "'Well, I don't see the money,' said his son, as he picked it up and placed it on the table. "'And I bet I never shall.' "'It must have been your fancy, father,' said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. "'Never mind, though. There's no harm done. But it gave me a shock all the same.' They sat down by the fire again, while the two men finished their pipes. Outside the wind was higher than ever, and the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence, unusual and depressing, settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. "'I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed,' said Herbert, as he bade them good night. "'And something horrible squatting up on top of the wardrobe, watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains.' He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that, with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw and, with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. Two. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room, which it had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard, with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. "'I suppose all old soldiers are the same,' said Mrs. White. "'The idea of our listening to such nonsense! How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you, father?' "'Might drop on his head from the sky,' said the frivolous Herbert. "'Morris said the things happened so naturally,' said his father, "'that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence.' "'Well, don't break into the money before I come back,' said Herbert, as he rose from the table. "'I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you.' His mother laughed, and following him to the door, watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of bibulous habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. "'Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home,' she said, as they sat at dinner. "'I dare say,' said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. "'But for all that, the thing moved in my hand. That I'll swear to.' "'You thought it did,' said the old lady soothingly. "'I say it did.' replied the other. There was no thought about it. I had just... What's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the two hundred pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it, and then, with sudden resolution, flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White, at the same moment, placed her hands behind her, and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room, 
He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. She then waited as patiently as her sex would permit for him to broach his business. But he was at first strangely silent. I was asked to call, he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I come from Ma and Megan's. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? she asked breathlessly. Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? Her husband interposed. There, there, mother, he said hastily. Sit down and don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. And he eyed the other wistfully. I'm sorry, began the visitor. Is he hurt? demanded the mother wildly. The visitor bowed in assent. Badly hurt, he said, quietly. But he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, said the old woman, clasping her hands. Thank God for that. Thank... She broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's face. She caught her breath, and turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling old hand upon his. There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery, said the visitor at length, in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White, in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring blankly out at the window, and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly forty years before. He was the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. The other coughed, and rising, walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, he said, without looking round. I beg that you will understand I am only their servant and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand, and rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, How much? Two hundred pounds, was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. Three. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load, too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed, and expectation gave place to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back, he said tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son, said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm, and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully, and then slept, until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw, she cried wildly, the monkey's paw. 
He started up in alarm. Where? Where is it? What's the matter? She came stumbling across the room toward him. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it. It's in the parlor, on the bracket, he replied, marveling. Why? She cried and laughed together, and bending over, kissed his cheek. I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? he questioned. The other two wishes, she replied rapidly. We've only had one. Was that not enough? he demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly and wish our boy alive again. The man sat up in bed and flung the bed clothes from his quaking limbs. Good God, you're mad, he cried aghast. Get it, she panted. Get it quickly and wish. Oh, my boy, my boy. Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. Why not the second? Ah, coincidence, stammered the old man. Go and get it and wish, cried his wife, quivering with excitement. The old man turned and regarded her. His voice shook. He has been dead ten days. And besides, he... I would not tell you else, but I could only recognize him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman and dragged him toward the door. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him, and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way round the table and groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish! she cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish! repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank, trembling, into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward, the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches, and striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs the match went out, and he paused to strike another, and at the same moment a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room, and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. "'What's that?' cried the old woman, starting up. "'A rat,' said the old man in shaking tones. "'A rat. It passed me on the stairs.' His wife sat up in bed, listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert, she screamed. It's Herbert. She ran to the door, 
but her husband was before her and catching her by the arm held her tightly. What are you going to do? He whispered hoarsely. It's my boy! It's Herbert! She cried, struggling mechanically. I forgot it was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let go! I must open the door! For God's sake, don't let it in! cried the old man, trembling. You're afraid of your own son? She cried, struggling. Let me go! I'm coming, Herbert! I'm coming! There was another knock, and another. The old woman, with a sudden wrench, broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing, and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice, strained and panting. "'The boat!' she cried loudly. "'Come down! I can't reach it!' But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back, and the door opened a cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. Okay, so welcome back, and I hope you enjoyed the story. So so do you think we should actually do an episode, or should we just let people go their way? There's, there's trick-or-treating to be had. That's true. There's lots of candy out there that folks should go and avail themselves of. So we don't want to take up your time. Oh, wait, wait, I've changed my mind. Let's take up their time. Oh, Let's okay. see if we can get this up to an hour. We could probably, if we blather on a lot, I bet. We tend to do that. So why did you decide on, on your own free time to do a recording of The Monkey's Paw? A few years ago, when I was still in Los Angeles, I would record audio versions of my own stories. Uh -huh. And I believe I did one of your story uh, one time, I think. And I burned it onto a CD and I sent it to you. And you're like, yeah, this isn't anything. You didn't even get the title right. Um, <laughs> it had no title. I think you invented one for it. There were certain stories out there that I hadn't ever heard audios of, uh, like there were certain Stephen King stories that from the days before, you know, audiobooks, mm -hmm. uh, or before everything came out on audiobooks that I had never heard. So I thought, well, it would be fun to do a recording of this story for my friends who absolutely would not read, but maybe they would <laughs> listen. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Nowadays, people just have so much to distract them. I guess we've talked about that. And there's so much internet porn out there, and it's not going to download itself. That's so, true. you know, you got to have your priorities. There were a couple of stories, one in particular uh, by Stephen King called The Jaunt. My friend Brian w would not read a book to save his life. In fact, that's what ended his life. Oh, that's too um, bad. It, it is sad, but now that he's gone, let's just have a chuckle about it. I told him all about this story, The Jaunt, which I think I talked about on Better Teleportation Device episode. Uh -huh. that was just this really plausible science fiction story about teleportation and when it goes wrong. And I told him about it and he's like, oh, wow, that sounds really cool. Never going to read the story. And I'm like, oh, dude, it's only 15 pages long or, or whatever it happened to be. And he's like, no, Clint Eastwood said a man's mm -hmm. got to know his limitations. And uh, he knew he would never read it. So I thought I'm going to make an audio of this for him. And yeah, I included all sorts of screaming and yelling and shrieking and stuff for the end of the story. Spoiler alert. And uh, after I was evicted, or I, I burned it onto a CD like I did for you. And I lent it to him. And he wouldn't yeah, listen to it either. Huh? He, he couldn't get around to listening to it. Yes. Ooh, you beat me to the punch. But I got a lot of pleasure out of that. 
I, I don't have any children, but I imagine that you get a certain sense of joy from reading to your kids. And when my little sister was young, I liked to read to her. And every Christmas, I'd read her a Christmas carol. And so I was like, wow, this is addictive. And I started reading all sorts of things. And one of the first things I grabbed was The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs. And it's weird. I don't know how big a deal this story was when it first came out. But I've looked him up before, and there's not a lot of stuff out there by W.W. W. Jacobs to be had. I guess maybe he would have a short story collection or something, and we could Possible. read more things. But this is a really famous story, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah well, there's like a, a million different versions of this out there. There's movies. There's BBC productions. There's radio plays. There's Simpsons episodes. Everything has done the monkey's paw. In fact, our senior year of college, there were dueling productions of student films <laughs> of the monkey's paw. I worked on and one of them. I worked on the other one. I played the man from the factory that comes with the check ah. in the one that I worked on. And you edited one, right? Yeah, I did. Isn't that amazing? It's just <laughs> strange. But when I actually recorded this, I didn't know that you could find hundreds of recordings of it on the internet. What is that site that has all public domain stuff in it? LibriVox. Uh, LibriVox, I think, is one of those places where you could record yourself reading something and upload it, and other people can just download it for free. Yep. Kind of like what we do, only it's all public domain right, stuff. Right, that's right. Yeah, there's actually several versions of The Monkey's Paw on LibriVox, so uh, it's out there. It would have been cool if we could have done like a multicast reading of it, although that's out there on yeah. LibriVox. And plus, we just didn't have the time. Yeah, that was the biggest problem. It does take a lot of effort to put together a show. So we figured just as a, a bit of a special gift, we'd give you the uh, Rish Outfield edition. I, I've never really discussed it with you. Are you a fan of this story? or? I like this story a lot, but I think it's one of those stories that suffers from the fact that there are a million versions out there of it. It's been used in countless sitcoms, TV shows, cartoons, etc. To the point where it's hard to think it's cool or be excited by it. It's old enough that it's no longer fresh, I guess. And there's a lot of other stories. I know that you're a big fan of A Christmas Carol. I knew you'd go there. And A Christmas Carol is the same thing. Everybody's done it so many times. If you're a fan of it, then at the very least, there's likely to be one version out there that you're going to love because there's 50 to choose from. Last Christmas, I got a hold of a Jim Dale reading of A Christmas Carol. You know, I love Jim Dale's readings of anything, and A Christmas Carol's a great story. So it was fun to listen to Jim Dale read A Christmas Carol. You know, a lot of times when I'm watching The Twilight Zone, I'm just shocked by how powerful that show is now in the 21st century and, you know, the twists or the ideas presented there. And it boggles my mind to imagine 1959 audiences, 1961 kids or adults sitting in front of a television and seeing that then. What would they have to compare it to? What would their reaction have been to realize that it's a cookbook or that – she had been beautiful all along and wanted to be ugly or that Willoughby is a funeral home. You know, these things were just like, oh, wow. And, you know, maybe there are kids out there that see it and it's like black and white. This sucks. Thank you. Glad to have my cousin back in here. Now, please go back to the hell from whence you came. But Monkey's Paw, 1902. So I don't know. It may be possible that in O2, there were all sorts of stories, morality plays or cautionary tales. Be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. Maybe this was cutting edge and disturbing as hell to people. Well, I, I don't know. It was enough to make it stick around. There's a few stories. There's a very few short stories that are like that. Like what else? Has W.W. W. Jacobs done? Can anybody name something else? Who knows? But everybody knows the monkey's paw. Nobody's not heard that story before because it's that big of a deal. It stuck around from 1902 to 2002 and beyond. beyond, beyond. beyond. And it's still that big of a deal. I mean, I, I read that story when I was in seventh grade, I believe, as part of my class. I was mentioning to you before we started recording The Most Dangerous Game, which is another short story that uh, has stuck around forever. But yeah, aside from that, it's hard to think of anything that's uh, as 
well known as prevalent. And I don't think it's even close to what the monkey's paw is, where that one's that much more of a ubiquitous societal presence. I know that uh, we are going on and on. I was joking about the hour. Uh, uh, one thing about the ending, though. Does the ending bother you? They open the door and there's nothing there. In what way? Well, I remember Bart Simpson. You open the door and there's nothing there and Bart says, You know what would have been scarier than nothing? Anything! And my friend Jeff, let's say ex-friend, because he says this a lot, he always says that. Anytime we're watching anything, he'll say, You know what would be scarier than nothing? And I'll just be like, Dancing at your funeral would be. Stop saying that. But I think it was directly in response to this monkey's paw type. Well, I don't think that ending is supposed to be a scary ending. That's the happy ending, as, as happy as the ending of the monkey's paw can be. They could have opened the door and found just what exactly was on the other side if the wish didn't work, and it wouldn't have been a happy ending in that case. But at the very least, they're able to you know, move on with life and have have their life as it were instead of being destroyed by some sort of zombie sun that's on the other side of that door. They're not trying to be scary at the end of that uh, story, I don't think. I don't know where I first read the story. I was probably lots younger, like third grade or something like that. Because, of course, I would have sought out scary things, horror. And I remember having a short story collection called The Monkey's Paw and Other Tales of Terror. I'm sure I got that in like second or third grade. Except it was for the given Paw. to you at your birth. Darndest thing, nurse. He came out with this book in his hand. <laughs> you don't want to know what was in the placenta. Uh, An X-Wing fighter. Painful. <laughs> with the wings in attack mode. Oh, it's a trap. Anyway, folks, I don't ever remember the ending bothering me. But it, it might have, because, because as a kid, you'd be like, no, I want to see it. I want to see what's there, where maybe you don't understand yet that what the power of it is what you saw in your mind. Yeah, what, there is always that. The way that Abbott looks <laughs> in my head is really, really frightening. Well, the curtains. <laughs> hey, that's not funny, man. There's a blind man in my town called Herbert. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Shoot, I, I wanted to say this a long time before when I was talking about the 1902 audiences. Dracula was written in 1897. Okay. And there's this part where his brides come and he feeds an infant to them. Reading that in the 21st century, it chilled my blood. He, Dracula had taken an infant from a gypsy woman and gave it to his wives to eat. And it was crying and, and Jonathan Harker sees it. And I was just like, holy sh... Nikes. Now, but a hundred years ago, what was the reaction to that passage? No big deal. They're used to it back then. They did it all the time. Oh. You know you like it. You know, that's one of those things. So the things that are so ridiculously shocking, like, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, in 1939... Was that really shocking? I, I can't even conceive of a world because that's the line that people remember from Gone with the Wind. And it was in the book as well. And I remember that Metro Golden Mayor had all sorts of problems with the frickin' censors over that one word. And they said, you know, if we let that word out, it's going to be a slippery slope. And the next thing you know, kids are going to grow their hair long and protest some unjust war in Southeast Asia. Turns out they were right, apparently. It's, it's, we have a sanitized view on the past, I suppose. Yeah. And it may be that there was far more disturbing, far gruesomer stuff around in those days than the monkey's paw or Dracula. Yeah, that's what they read to take their mind off of the terrible times. All the people dying of the influenza and the endless war. Mosquitoes the size of Dotsons. Giving everyone um, malaria. They hadn't yet discovered farting, so people, their, their stomachs just got all distended. Could they figure that out? Okay, well, we've been talking for a long time. I guess the point I'm trying to make is I still find this story to be relevant. still find it scary, disturbing, and a powerful piece, even though we're a century later. I just thought this might derail the whole conversation, but I just thought of another few stories that are short stories that have stuck around. The Telltale Heart and some oh, of Edgar Allan Poe's other stories. He's got a few of them that are ones that have stuck around just as much, but I'd say The Telltale Heart is his number one story, and that's one of those that still makes as much of a 
impact now as then, although it doesn't get as much replay value in sitcoms and etc. like uh, Monkey's Paw does. First season of The Simpsons, The Telltale Head. I tried to rail us back, but the train is already on its side. Oh, darn. You can see hobo legs sticking out. Are you going somewhere with this, guys? Because I thought you were talking about something else. I love Halloween, as I said last week. Just thought it would be cool to give the audience of one an extra bit of audio magic. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, those words slipped from my mouth. Um, Aroid O.T. Aroid, is he not here today? Oh, shoot. He's trick-or-treating right now, actually. What did he go as? He's dressed as a Cylon. Well, because he's a robot. I bet that's pretty easy. No, no, he's actually as the one uh, Trisha Helfer in the red dress and everything. No way. Yeah, really. It's pretty impressive. Oh, I guess I sort of like to see that. Does that make me a bad person? Yes. We'll be right back after these messages. time of year is at last upon us, when ghouls and spooks roam freely, witches bubble their cauldrons, and vampires stride freely in the streets. Ah, yes, it's Halloween, and what better way to start your Hallow's Eve than by listening to live radio drama. Listen to a special edition of Radio Drama Revival, brought to you by Final Rune Productions and Portland, Maine's community radio, WMPG. Four original tales of terror brought to life by top voice actors and bone-crunching sound effects. Tune in from 7 to 9 Eastern Time, Saturday, October 31st, on WMPG.org, or from the link on FinalRune.com. And maybe you can give some money so that WMPG can... <laughs> power up. Remember, Halloween night, just before the werewolves run. Go to WMPG.org, FinalRune.com, or Radio DramaRevival.com and get spooked. <laughs> Music by Kevin McLeod. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> Happy Halloween, folks. Yes. And I guess we'll see you again next year. Uh, oh, don't tell Kevin. He'll put us on a headstone. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye. At the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. Only not this time. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. Press the button. Thanks for listening again, guys. The Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. About the author. W.W. W. Jacobs is dead. He used to be alive and wrote stories. Aww. W.W. W. Jacobs stories have been heard in necrotic tissue. <laughs> and the, uh, I am this meat. <laughs> and one more, one more really disturbing titled one. Shy Zine. Ooh. <laughs> and Clown Pod. And eh, whatever you say, guys.